I, uh, I went to Alaska and uh, felt the urge to go up there. And, and so I got into radio there in Fairbanks and was in radio for, uh, for a period of time as chief announcer with uh, KFAR, uh, the Midnight Sun Broadcasting Company. And then they decided to go television and I was asked to be station manager and also continued uh, doing talent work and on, a, on camera stuff with that. I was thinking of coming back. This was after about uh, eight years up there. And uh, a, a fellow who worked with me in, uh, in Fairbanks happened to have lunch with Dave Crockett, who was then program director for, for KOMO. Uh, and they were looking for a Captain Puget type character. One guy who had been doing a lot of adventuring, was uh, comfortable in front of a camera, uh, had some, some, some background that would be viable and uh, he suggested to me. And Dave knew me from the past, so uh, I got this call, said fly down, let's talk about it, and I did, and uh, we talked about it and they hired me. They, what they wanted was a grizzled, old, bearded sea captain. I said, no way, no character parts. It's either gonna be me or forget it. So it was me. He wanted a seagoing character because of the nature of the community. He wanted him to have uh, an adventurous background. Uh, he wanted to do things that would be adventurous and, and, and interesting to the kids. In other words, he wanted to do something besides show cartoons. And so he invented uh, the Captain Puget character, of course, coming from uh, the original uh, Lieutenant Peter Puget. The boat was called the Windward Four, four after Channel Four, Windward because it was a nice romantic name. And it also happened to be the name of a schooner that had been sunk as a breakwater off the, uh, the, uh, the harbor, uh, Seattle Harbor. And so all these things put together, and we were given an idea of what we were going to do. In fact, I even started out with a husky dog because we'd had a, a shot taken with me uh, and a husky uh, in Alaska. And we had a guy that came in and played the accordion and I sang songs. Turns out they decided they didn't want to pay for the husky dog eventually, so we got rid of the dog. The accordionist was a little expensive and so they asked me to get a guitar and learn to play the guitar, which I did. They wanted me to be a skin diver, which I became. They wanted me to ride horses, which I became. They wanted me to go out and be a, be a very active type of an individual and bring in the film of what I was doing or what other interesting people were doing. We wanted to glue the cartoons together. We knew that there was gonna be a, a, an action adventure section in there. We knew there would be uh, something in the way of, of, uh, of a little lesson, an informative lesson. Uh, we knew there would be songs in it where there was usually a guest. Quite frequently, the guest was Ivor Haglin, uh, which was how he became associated with the program. And then it was mostly because, not because he was Ivor especially, although that had a large part of it, uh, was a large part of it, but because he could play the guitar and sing. He could entertain. And we used to stand, watch you and I, and sing, yeah, sing old waving songs, mm -hmm. didn't we? I just happen to have a guitar here, oh, God. which belongs to you. Mm -hmm. And I'll give it to you. If you promise to sing this wailing song with me. If you'll help me, Cap. I'll help you. I'll help you. This is a real serious one. Yes, too. it is. It's a dandy. And the wonderful thing is, instead of Greenland, as it mentions, they're doing it right off the coast of Washington, right off British Columbia. Right. It was in 1853, and of June the 13th day, that our gallant ship her anchor weighed and for Greenland bore away, brave boys. We never had the slightest idea that uh, it would last as long as it did. Uh, we never had the slightest idea that, that a year after it got started, it would wind up uh, getting a Sylvania Award as, as the most creative local children's program in the nation. We never got the idea that when we said we would carry mail up to Santa Claus in North Pole, Alaska, they would have to put on five people to take care of the mail. So these things just happen with television. This shows uh, what depth that the skin diver is in. For example, it could be in 25 or 50 or 75 or 100 feet of water. And they're in an average sized aqualung or, or tank. There's about 2,300 pounds of pressure, which is good for an hour at 30 feet, and that's why it's necessary to know how deep you are. As a matter of fact, there's all sorts of special gear necessary, especially when you're skin diving in our own Puget Sound area. Because as you know, the water temperature varies just a little bit around here, summer and winter. Now we're all fixed up and ready to go, and we're searching 
for octopus. And we're looking around for the octopus, and there he is. Now, of course, he doesn't know that we see him, or he'd be scooting out of there in a hurry. But he's, he's down here in about 30 feet of water. Here I am, I'm coming down, I'm putting my hands in the slits on either side of his mantle. And this has the effect of stopping off his breath. And now uh, he's, he's weak enough so that we can handle him. But of course, the main thing here is to keep those tentacles away from my face mask. Well, of course, one of the characters was Chief Chinook, who, of course, still lives here. He's out there in the pasture, you can see him. He's 31 years old. Um, he was featured on the show for about four or five years as a talking horse. Well, let's face it, horses don't talk, okay? Although there were some, some adults who used to go through the trailer when I was out on, on, uh, on personal appearances in the, in the parking lot. The kids knew the horse couldn't talk. We'd have a tape recorder going through some of these things that he would say, and some of the parents would look, actually look surprised that I had the voice coming out of a tape recorder rather than the horse. <laughs> Anyway, there was at one point when we would load his film and you'd see shots of Chinook and he would be moving his lips, actually trying to get rid of a rubber band that we'd placed around his lower teeth. Uh, one day it was loaded upside down, so we had a you know, picture of Chinook trying to talk upside down. Uh, and then we came out of that uh, uh, with some interesting things to say. Um, there was a time when uh, when Bill DeRay, who was my floor man, we had a little thing called a porthole, the magic porthole, and buzzy. And, uh, and that, would, that would buzz. And, uh, and I would talk back and forth to this stupid porthole. And one day, uh, it would respond with somebody else's voice. And one day, Bill DeRay stuck his face right through the plastic <laughs> of the porthole. And there he was talking back to me, you see. My wife, uh, Linda, and I have had three children. One of them is in college now. But they're around all the time, and, and I've been around kids most of my life. And I don't like to talk down to them, so I didn't. I didn't talk down to them on the air. I talked to them. I sang to them. And uh, it, it was altogether different from, from the routine of, uh, that they normally had expected. What I tried to do was show them that what they had out there was something they could enjoy that it was of extreme interest to them, uh, that it was part of our state, that it was part of our state's history, and that if they went out and did it, they would enjoy their life around here a lot more. And I'm sure there are a lot nicer ways of putting it, but that's kind of what it was. I wanted to show them, that, yeah, you can do it. It's out here. Uh, you can skin dive, you can climb those hills, you can ski those slopes. Uh, you can get involved in all kinds of things. You can ride the horses, you can have your boat, you can do all this sort of thing and learn something about the country at the same time. And I think the thing that really brought that forcibly back to mind was a conversation I had with a man who's a very successful businessman now. And I had occasion to meet him <clears throat> not too long ago and he came up to me and he said, Don, he said, you don't know this, but when I was growing up, I was I was a, a youngster who uh, was kind of withdrawn. I wasn't part of the crowd. I was not a good athlete. Uh, and I began to think perhaps at some point if my parents was, w would wonder what sort of individual I would turn out to be. But he said, by watching your program, I was able to see the, all of the things out there that were available to me. And he said, vicariously, along with you, I did them. And he said, as a result, when, by the time I grew up, I felt that I'd experienced all this. And he said it was terribly important to the formation of my character. And he said, I just thought you'd like to know that. Until then, we've got just one more thing to say to you. Smooth sailing, and bye for now. He sailed into the harbor, and he smiled at what he found. Mighty fir trees, roaring streams, majestic mountains, and the sound. His name was Captain Puget, he was brave and kind and strong. Captain Puget is his name. His eyes beheld the beauty of the land beyond the shore. He was Good captain sailing, Captain. The Windward Four with its skipper, Captain Puget, is running before the wind to gather more adventures for our seafaring mates. Be with us again tomorrow for more cartoons, stories, and adventures and fun when we heave to at our rendezvous position, Channel 4 at 3.30 o'clock. Smooth sailing, mate.